Hi, I'm Han Brown, and welcome to Boomer Living Broadcast. As baby boomers, we are living through an unprecedented time in history. Our generation is aging faster than any other before us, and we are facing unique challenges and opportunities. At Boomer Living, we understand that the needs of seniors are constantly changing. That's why we offer a wide range of resources to help baby boomers live their best lives. So whether you're looking for information on senior health care, digital health, dementia, Parkinson's, caregiving, technology adoption, affordable senior living options, or financial insecurity, well, we've got you covered. Our goal is to provide practical information and support to help you navigate this new phase in life. So please join us as we explore the exciting opportunities and challenges that come with growing older. I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and I'm excited that you're here. We want to encourage everyone to participate, so please chime in and let, uh, let us know what's on your mind. Um, for those in the audience, leave a comment to let us know where you're, you're from and uh, what industry that you work in. So today's topic is Aging is inevitable, but biological aging, well, that's optional. For thousands of years, humans have been aging, and as our technology has progressed, so has our understanding of aging. We now know that while chronological aging is inevitable, but biological aging is not. And that's why it's important to understand biology of aging. We can reduce our risk factors for disease and improve our quality of life, by making conscious choices about how we live our lives. When you hear that the baby boomer generation is getting older and people are living longer than ever before, what does that mean for us? Well, the definition of aging successfully is up for debate. Some people think that the baby boomers are taking advantage of the system and should retire earlier. Others argue that we need to find a way to financially support older adults who are unable to work. There's also concerns about whether or not the healthcare system can handle an aging population. Many baby boomers are choosing to stay active and healthy well into their golden years. So it's important to remember that each person's experience with aging is unique. We should also be prepared for the challenges and opportunities that come with growing older. Will the baby boomers be the last generation to experience successful aging? Or will the millennials and Generation X continue to enjoy the good health into their golden years? Well, only time would tell. But one thing is for sure, the science of aging is constantly evolving and we're only getting better at fighting the effects of age-related disease. No matter what the future holds, we should all strive to age gracefully and with dignity. Today, Join me is Dr. Grillo Maria Pesanetti. He is a world-renowned expert in aging and Alzheimer's disease. He has dedicated his life to understanding the root causes of brain disorders. By developing model systems of brain disorders, he has been able to clarify the underlying mechanisms and develop preventative and therapeutic approaches for neurological disorders. His research has earned him a strong record of successful and productive endeavors. He's currently the Saunders Family Chair and Professor of Neurology at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, as well as the Director of Basic and Biomedical Research and Training Program of the James Peters Veterans Affairs Medical Center. So Dr. Aguilo, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much, Ann. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, being here, and thank you for having me. Yeah, I thank you for your time. And uh, we're, we're talking about a very important topic that affects everybody, and I appreciate your making the time to shed your expertise. Um, yeah, so, so can you tell us a little bit about your professional and personal background? Yeah, yeah. Um... I uh, I've been educated in uh, I'm an, I'm in uh, as a medical doctor, and uh, and um, and one of my major interests since the medical school I actually was trying to understand 
uh, the biological aspect of uh, why we age. We were, I, I was particularly enticed by the fact that uh, in the transition between the 80s and the 90s, um, uh, we were uh, at the, let's say, at the crossroad of better understanding what is actually medicine uh, that in general we deliver, or actually care that we deliver to the general population and understanding that indeed uh, the geriatric medicine based on primarily on uh, gerontological kind of uh, evidence uh, that are basically the science of studying the mechanism of aging in different species, in mammals and uh, Etc. So basically, I had the uh, opportunity to join uh, uh, the School of Gerontology uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, where actually I created all my background in uh, into the mechanism of uh, into the potential mechanism of how and why actually we age. And the, one of the most important things is also. Uh, that uh, if uh, maybe even in this kind of philosophical kind of aspect of the discussion that we will have today, um, I had the fortune then eventually to join the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, where we were able to really to move on and uh, put into, into the contest, basically in the real world, some of this kind of uh, information that uh, eventually will lead to what is maybe uh, the concept of uh, of the modern uh, modern geriatrics and uh, how we eventually are going to be uh, develop this conceptual framework of the mechanism of aging into something that can be a therapeutic approach or actually as we will discuss today maybe even a preventative kind of initiative so that is actually uh, where we're coming from and the reason why uh, I, uh, after that, uh, during this period, I started really to develop as a, just as a neuroscientist, uh, the better, uh, the best way of how to integrate this mechanism, mechanism of associated of why we age, and uh, maybe uh, using experimental model, uh, translational study, clinical application, uh, to come up with, with an answer that actually uh, is in some way a kind of a joint venture between gerontology and geriatrics to better understanding what I just said, the geriatric medicine that nevertheless actually was born in our institution in Mount Sinai with the first, uh, uh, with the first uh, textbook on geriatric medicine. We were treating before subject, uh, adult subject and uh, uh, instead of adult uh, or adulthood that we can call uh, we do not want to use the term aging, but uh, uh, delayed uh, or actually late, later, later, laterhood, um, and actually moving on from there. Because I, I think the treatment and understanding of how our population, particularly population as we will discuss today, as we are going to live longer, our longevity, they need actually to be viewed in a completely different manner from the medical and also from the uh, interventional point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. So are the baby boomers living longer lives and aging successfully? And, and do you think this is a result of uh, our species evolution or an artifact of civilization? Well, actually, let me just uh, uh, make a step back uh, backward. Um, I think that there is a very important kind of a uh, uh, very kind of important uh, aspect that we need to discuss. And of course, uh, uh, it's not my intention uh, really to, uh, uh, for, in particular for this particular, uh, for this particular kind of uh, uh, seminar or actually discussion, uh, I can see that this actually looks like a, a way of uh, a nice uh, way to exchange idea. Um, uh, let me tell you that uh, I don't want to really to discuss in terms of uh, the overall evolutionary aspect of uh, how and how we got here. Let's try actually to start in a more recent term, uh, recent uh, in a recent year, if we can call them a recent year. Um, we need to think about that. Uh, um, that, uh, 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 for example. Uh, human share uh, the uh, the best uh, uh, the the uh, actually share the uh, the best uh, common ancestor uh, as a fast common uh, as the best common ancestor with with chimpanzee for example 
uh, going back into 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, then, uh, as I will explain, and how we are going to move on into this kind of a conceptual framework of uh, how we are going to get to the evolution and eventually to the last 100 years, actually, we are going to make in a kind of 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes, a brief discussion of how we can interpret uh, how we age and the mechanism of aging, uh, just a better understanding that in terms of evolution, uh, we actually, in a term of evolution, in terms of the pressure of evolution, put us only not only just as uh, humans, but also different species, uh, uh, plants, uh, fish, or many other different kind of uh, 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 living uh, organism, including uh, unicellular cells. So basically, if we had to go back uh, to really to the entire concept of evolution, we actually we had to go back billions of years. So I thought that it is just a better understanding that is in some way how we got to the last hundred years. So we will make a change of uh, as uh, uh, as uh, as uh, what happened and why the evolution pressure. Uh, brought us to where we are, and then we will start making a big jump from uh, 4.5 million years ago to uh, where we are, and then we will better understand why we are actually confronting in these days one of the fundamental aspects of uh, the process that eventually we will define even in the process of aging. So the, basically, the idea is that uh, it's been an extraordinary journey into the evolutionary process as I said, 4.5 billion years ago, a million years ago, uh, we've shared the best share that we had uh, with, as a common ancestor of chimpanzee. And then something became, uh, something actually became extraordinary that about uh, 700,000 years ago, then uh, when uh, uh, we have seen that the pressure of a evolution led us to something that is I still consider one of the most uh, extraordinary aspects of our process of evolution that is basically the expansion of, uh, of the brain. Basically, brain and the expansion in particular of the cerebral cortex. Uh, this uh, went back to basically moving toward our century, uh, going back from the 700,000 years uh, uh, Ago, we actually we start actually initiating to see uh, about forty thousand years ago uh, the concept actually concept the description both uh, from uh, anthropologists and uh, many other different kind of uh, biologists interested in uh, in this field that, that uh, uh, the appearance of what uh, became the Homo sapiens Homo sapiens from where actually we. Uh, we uh, uh, we are uh, we are evolving as actually move on. What happened? And then uh, actually, uh, even before the Homo sapiens, the Homo neanderthal, the actually for which there is a very little understanding for uh, the short period of time, and then disappear, and for which we have a uh, no really major kind of understanding. So what I actually want just to say that the pressure of evolution led us in some way uh, primarily. Uh, for uh, really uh, um, uh, move on with a one fundamental concept that is basically the concept of the best fit into the evolution that is basically making us uh, one each other, different each other, and uh, there is no one single element in particular I'm talking about. Uh, uh, we were talking about uh, mammals, and, but, but this is true also in other in trees, it's, it's true in fish, is true in insects, just to make us really very individual, uh, um, individual, they are different one each other. So basically, uh, the idea, this has been uh, the pressure of evolution uh, has been fundamental uh, because uh, uh, for a natural selection and the survival of the species, uh, it was a very important that uh, this diversity uh, was extremely important uh, in terms of, uh, I'm talking about uh, now for uh, mammals, but as I said, for three uh, and many other, uh, and many other different kind of living species. Uh, so the bottom line is that uh, we got, uh, we got here uh, primarily because uh, evolution, the evolution pressure, 
basically uh, conducted us in the last uh, billions of uh, million, actually. We started, as I said, from a 4.5 million years ago as a all common share uh, of a, uh, just sharing as a common ancestor chimpanzee. But nevertheless, is uh, something very important that uh, what is the fundamental answer though, is uh, again, I want just to uh, repeat maybe uh, twice, but it's very important that we keep this in mind, that the pressure of the evolution is basically something that led us to really to uh, have uh, all this kind of diversity uh, that eventually allowed us to really to branch on in kind of different direction and making us uh, and promoting this kind of diversity. Uh, this is based on uh, physiological features uh, uh, in terms of the ecosystem that we were living in the last million of years. Um, the uh, evolution pressure, for example, in the concept of reproductive fitness has been one of the fundamental aspects for the reproduction, actually for the continuation of our own species. And nevertheless, all these kind of different changes that are uh, uh, profound, and of course, I don't want even to uh, think about to really to get into the, uh, into the specific detail, ended up with uh, something uh, with uh, this concept of uh, basically the idea of the survival of the uh, of the fittest that is basically is how uh, this kind of uh, promotion or, or uh, let's say uh, this uh, pressure uh, that is uh, uh, from evolution led us to really to uh, select a only certain kind of uh, only certain kind of uh, species that were uh, able to adapt into the system and to continue an evolution, and most important, uh, giving us the opportunity to reproduce, to move on, and having the kind of reproductive fitness that allow us to fit into an environment that eventually lead us uh, now, uh, as I said, and I'm making a lot of assumption into this kind of discussion for a reason of time, that lead to our uh, uh, to our main discussion of today, but uh, all the uh, all our listeners need to keep in mind that who we are today is basically a process that it took million and million of years with one fundamental goal: the uh, the uh, evolution pressure to make us as an individual that are one different in each other. Because if we were all together, we were all all similar in some way, it would be sufficient that uh, a pandemic, we are not going to talk about COVID right now, or maybe a disease, or uh, maybe a condition that eventually would uh, uh, make susceptible uh, most of us, or maybe incapacity uh, to promote what we consider reproductive fitness, basically our species will end up in basically in nowhere. Now, this is true for uh, mammals, it's, more, uh, it's true for uh, rodents as other form of mammals, but it's also true in, uh, uh, for example, in tree is, uh, is uh, for example, uh, we see evidence uh, that uh, tree, there are different kinds of tree that are actually able to survive and live a thousand of years uh, versus tree that actually have a lifespan of about uh, 50 or 100 years and we are as i said moving into our last 100 years with this idea that now we move from 4.5 million years ago in a very in a very very superficial way to the last 100 years now the concept now of evolution that we are going to talk about an artificial uh, what actually potential uh, uh, an artifact of our civilization and, uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, we will discuss as uh, we, we will move on, uh, the theories of aging. The theories of aging that can divide is uh, how actually, uh, how we are, uh, uh, primarily why we are going to get, uh, why we are actually um, uh, getting old, why there is this process of aging. And then again, is how this uh, really happened. Is still uh, again a, a um, is still again a, one of the uh, let's say science that goes back into term of evolution 
to try to understand how this kind of things that are happening to during our the during the pressure revolution that led us as a select individuals uh, that actually reached the last hundred years. So instead of really to discuss uh, how, we will discuss primarily why and mm -hmm. then why we, there are uh, why we are in this kind of uh, condition, and then maybe we will understand the several and during our discussion uh the concept uh the concept that uh, maybe uh, we are still maybe in the process of evolution there is no question about and even us as uh, human beings even if we went through this kind of uh, pressure of evolution uh for uh, basically uh, leading into the uh into the uh best fit as a best fit for survival as i actually said before the survival of the fittest. Um, uh, there are uh, still uh, there are there were even books written uh, written uh, to identify what is actually the concept of the scars of evolution. We are an unfinished kind of uh, 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 living uh, living in particular for human uh, human beings, uh, and uh, and uh, we can see, for example, our differences are really. Uh, how many uh, drawbacks, as in mm -hmm. some way, I would say, even a uh, uh, less, less kind of a potential we have compared to other kind of other uh, mammals, for example, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So basically just this, uh, uh, just to move uh, consistently uh, to not to look the track of our discussion today, basically I explained to you why evolution the evolution pressure is basically brought us to the last 100 years, uh, considering mm -hmm. even that uh, agriculture, uh, this is actually a very important kind of thing, agriculture techniques that allow to uh, form a certain kind of a societies uh, uh, date back at 10 to 12,000 years. And then eventually the first form of a society are uh, going back to 5,000 years ago. So, um, and uh, since then, the Sumer, for example, the Finnish, uh, Finnish is actually uh, where the first uh, form of, uh, of a real society that uh, then, just to give a break uh, from 4.5 million years ago from Chippezi to today, now uh, we can actually start talking about uh, what is happening in the last uh, 100 years. I will actually make two statements here, and actually very important, uh, that, as I said, that we are in continued evolution, maybe in a kind of different way. So, for example, um, the when I remember that uh, when um, we exchanged some of our uh, ideas of uh, how uh, better to deliver this kind of, uh, uh, this better deliver this, uh, this kind of discussion, um, I suggested that it was a, a gain a evolutionary, even in, in the last 100 years, uh, a kind of a, a very two important factor, as I said before, the evolution uh, of uh, our species in the last 100 years, and then the artifact of the civilization that uh, uh, there is no question about uh, uh, will open a lot of a discussion as a mm -hmm. world. So basically, just as an example of uh, evolution of uh, uh, we can call brain evolution in the last uh, in the last uh, in the last hundred years uh, that are, that were happened to me um, to participate and actually have uh, I've been witnessing extremely very interesting studies uh, in particular due to the fact of the artifact of of uh, civilization where we need also to think about in the last hundred years probably technological advancement and then innovation in the way how we interpret or how we understand the mechanism uh, allowed us, for example, uh, to understand that, uh, for example, a young individual, for example, there is a, a kind of an expansion of auditory cortex that actually connect a very strong with uh, uh, with uh, areas of uh, motivation, brain uh, region of motivation. This is actually put them in perspective. Uh, that is, uh, even as uh, we moved on from those 4.5 millions, 200 years uh, to the last 100 years, 
we are still probably due to technological advancement. We are capable really to identify that uh, uh, this idea of uh, moving into this kind of uh, imaging technique, uh, auditory and motivational expansion, means that actually uh, young generation will be able uh, probably to become more independent as much as actually we were uh, as a baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And in that way, uh, uh, the way of uh, how we are capable to perceive, uh, and there are a big science in uh, in terms of perception and, see, and signaling transduction and how the brain, uh, both emotional uh, mm -hmm. area as well as many other different regions that I do not want to get into the discussion, basically put us into something that we were not even uh, 50 or maybe 100 years ago. So that is actually when I discussed with you the concept of evolution of the last 100 years, just to say that uh, despite the fact that the pressure of evolution is keeping pressing to keep this kind of diversity, to ramify, to branching out, even as individual as in mammals, because of we need to maintain our own individuality is also very important and that is actually still going on. But there is something else that is now why we are getting old and now explaining uh, maybe how uh, this concept of, uh, uh, as I said, of uh, uh, an artifact of a civilization is the fact that uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, just in 1928, uh, we are going back. Uh, uh, we are going back uh, less than a century, uh, and uh, when Fleming actually discovered antibiotics, uh, we have uh, uh, we have revolutionized uh, our way of uh, how to move on with uh, the concept of uh, uh, of uh, survival, and we will talk about the longevity, mortality rate. Uh, but that was one of, uh, one of the example. The other, and I think one of the most important things to keep in mind, also the idea of the hygiene. Hygiene that is in the last 50 years, 60 years, uh, made us completely different kind of uh, human beings, if I can call now human beings, as actually we move on from all this uh, and then we make comparison to other species for example how we are going to live longer and mm -hmm. uh and this is a fundamental part because hygiene uh discoveries a technological advancement innovation that actually is a exponentially uh moving forward give us the opportunity to understand why and not i'm gonna go back to the how why we are basically living longer, what are maybe the reason why we are living longer, and if it's living longer and longevity is maybe something uh, uh, something that uh, we can explain. Mm -hmm. I want to, mm -hmm. And I stop here, and then I'm going to allow you to move on from there. Sure, sure, uh, yeah. <laughs> the concept is only three things that actually eventually we will discuss as we move on. Getting older, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. There are uh, basic, uh, basically good things. There are uh, uh, irrelevant aspect of a uh, process of aging. And then also there are, I don't want to use a catastrophic, but also there are a very detrimental aspect of aging. And mm -hmm. uh, from here, we can actually move on because I think that our audience need to understand that, that, that for, for and I, re I repeat, in the last billions of years, and I just told you from uh, the common ancestor, uh, 4.5 million years uh, to today, it's been a, a constant a process of evolution for uh, preserving our species uh, with uh, the idea of uh, promoting the best fit, basically the, uh, basically the uh, what I just uh, I told you before. And, um, uh, basically the, the concept of the survival of the fittest. And, um, and, uh, and now we are here and uh, we are all diverse. And that is actually one of the most important things. Uh, and uh, now uh, we can move on and understanding uh, after this kind of uh, premises, but was a 
fundamental that everybody needs to understand why we are all different and why we are here and what are the consequences and if we are continuing to move on with this kind of process of evolution. Great, great. Thank you so much. So thank you for elaborating um, the evolution and the artifact of civilization. I would like to take a little pause and just acknowledge our guests, okay? Thank you so much for joining today, Ruby, Ruby Moore, uh, Pam Stubbs, thank you, and Adriana from Portugal, uh, Greta Strong from Cornell Neurology, Linda Head from Texas. Hello, George Perry, how are you? Enjoy Hello, talking to you. <laughs> Hope you're doing well, George. Okay. Um, and um, Mark, Sarah, good to see you. Okay, thank you so much for folks that are chiming in. I'm going to uh, move on to the next topic or a um, couple questions that I have. You know, as children, we can't wait to grow up. We can't wait to be able to drive, vote, drink. We can't wait to move out of our parents' houses and start our own lives. But then suddenly we reach a certain age and we start to long for the days when we were young and carefree. We start to see the effects of aging, wrinkles, gray hair, and achy joints. And we begin to worry about our health and whether we will be able to enjoy our retirement years. And we start to wonder if there is anything that we can do to slow down the process of aging. Yes. Well, um, yeah. sorry, Anna. No, go ahead. So, so but, please uh, elaborate. Uh, I actually uh, intentionally I prepared the last sentence from uh, the long, uh, short term, uh, not even one on one uh, evolution class, uh, but uh, uh, cut it and fit it just uh, for uh, our audience. As I said before, aging is uh, is a combination of something that is inevitable something that is uh, negligible and something is very good. Keep in mind that uh, uh, a toddler that is going to learn uh, uh, how to speak is basically getting older. And uh, as we move on in, uh, in adulthood or a late uh, stage of adulthood, adulthood uh, several things actually can happen. So, um, there is a fundamental question here. I mean, for example, an inevitable is an inevitable, a, 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 let's say, a, a, a concept that there may be as a process of aging, as a, at least as a, because I'm experiencing here personally, and then it may be a negligible, is actually as we grow older, we actually develop a gray hair. So, well, that is actually even that one. Uh, is uh, is something that uh, a process of aging, but not necessarily one of those uh, most important things. Uh, there is, I don't think there is a lot of confusion in the term of what it actually is. The concept of aging, the concept of aging is uh, is being used uh, interchangeable with many other different kind of uh, uh, many other kind of different kind of uh, aspect. But the fundamental part that every one of us need to keep in mind. That aging not necessarily is uh, is uh, is a doom day. Is actually is not really the beginning of the end. Uh, what is the fundamental part? And that actually was very good. Uh, and to uh, I remember it was uh, one of your question. Actually, is a part uh, if uh, aging optional. Uh, well, the fact that actually we need to differentiate aging from senescence which is basically a fundamental part for understanding the biology of aging. Essentially, uh, and I, I, I will explain a little bit better what actually the concept of a senescence versus maybe uh, what is the concept of aging. Uh, as I said before, all of us, uh, we are basically diverse. That are, uh, we cannot generalize that they get in order it means actually to get sick. Uh, is actually we uh, we have a wonderful example of centenarian or uh, of uh, people in the 90s that actually they still perform uh, extremely well in their own uh, in in the field of art in the field of intellectuality in many different things. So therefore, aging is not uh, basically uh, what we need to consider a disease. Is actually the concept of the senescence. The concept of the senescence is basically 
in a biological sense is basically the idea that uh, uh, we reach during this process of aging a certain kind of uh, condition that basically organs are basically become less resilient and uh, being less resilient are not capable anymore to respond to whatever are going to be those mechanisms of aging that eventually we will discuss later and uh, functioning uh, at, mm, and functioning basically uh, um, uh, at a reduced uh, pace or actually get damaged. And uh, we need also to think about that uh, while maybe uh, there are negligible form of senescence uh, that, that maybe does do not interfere on uh, our quality of life, there is uh, no question about that we need to keep in mind that, that the brain and in particular the heart, uh, cardiovascular system, uh, in part, uh, they have uh, they are one of the most important kind of uh, organ that actually we need to keep uh, under control. And, uh, and we will talk about uh, um, how we, from the medical point of view, we will be able to really to uh, really to prevent or actually to promote uh, and to promote. So the bottom line is basically that uh, brain cells, once they're gone, they are actually not returning anymore, except a few evidence that the science has suggested that there may be, there are some kind of a, a potential of pluripotent cells in the brain that can actually regenerate neurons. Uh, this is something that is remaining still on the laboratory bench uh, and uh, translational study are still really moving on, but it, this is a very exciting kind of news. Nevertheless, the heart is the same thing. Once the heart is really losing some kind of uh, uh, losing uh, cells, basically ionotropic function that actually are important to really of uh, the left ventricle to really to bring into the circulation oxygenation of all our organ may lead to certain kind of uh, potential damages that are actually consequences, actually as a spread of consequences of uh, hypoxygenation, less, uh, uh, less, uh, uh, less uh, way of how this organ may eventually uh, may react and become resilient and become more susceptible in general to the kind of uh, factors that eventually we will discuss that why there are some certain mechanism that eventually accelerate this process one important thing is also to keep in mind is that uh, uh and then is supposed to be uh, uh as a mechanical uh, it's not even mechanical but uh, even an important things uh to keep in mind is that uh, uh, atherosclerosis is actually one of the fundamental part. So if we are not going to have, uh, if we are not going to have uh, the opportunity to really to deliver uh, the nutrients or actually to deliver uh, oxygen or actually to deliver anything that is necessary to the survival and then uh, good health of our organ, basically we are going to enter into a kind of condition that can initiate this process of senescence. So if we want just to generalize in some way, uh, people use even this term of successful aging versus unsuccessful aging. Nevertheless, the successful aging is something, unsuccessful aging is basically the process of really accumulating uh, because of we are all diverse based on the evolutionary aspect that I just told you before. And because we're all different, not necessarily this is a aging is a universal uh, is a universal kind of a phenomenon. Indeed, it's not. And uh, and also into the term of senescence, there are uh, not all the people become senescent. Uh, now, uh, even compare, for example, uh, in among different species, a uh, human lives uh, at the age of ninety, average speaking. Now we're living longer or shorter. And uh, uh, the chances of uh, develop Alzheimer's disease are uh, actually starting in the, there are uh, incidence and, percent, and percentage of a uh, potential onset of the disease that they initiated at the age of 65. So basically before 65, uh, the incidence uh, is basically 2% for certain kind of degenerative uh, disorder, in particular Alzheimer's disease. In uh, past the 65 and the 80, basically the, 
a proportion of a subject of with neurodegenerative disorder, in particular Alzheimer's disease, skyrocketed actually to 25. Uh, um, uh, chimpanzee, for example, uh, they live uh, an age of 30, and also they show potential incidence of uh, uh, of a sign of uh, Alzheimer's disease. For many other different kind of reasons, due to the different kind of organism metabolism, and again, they share us 5.6 million years. But it's also very important to keep in mind that. Uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, there are several other factors, uh, many people, and then we will talk that later. And as I have done before, I will anticipate what is basically the subject of uh, potential of our own communication here, our discussion. So uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, environmental factors uh, that eventually we will discuss then later. There are an amazing amount of uh, 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 evidence, uh, for example, from different species. For example, um, uh, for example, there are very good evidence that, uh, and we will talk about, for example, stress, uh, and uh, not to diverge uh, from uh, the real world for the study that actually we are going to discuss now, that, for example, salmon, uh, for example, in the Pacific, uh, they have a much higher uh, lifespan than actually the salmon that actually into the Pacific. The reason is because uh, spawning for uh, salmon into the sea is much a kind of easier uh, uh, reproductive, uh, 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 allowed to a, a much faster reproductive fitness compared, for example, to the salmon of the Pacific, where they actually they have to uh, roll over rivers and all this kind of a dynamic of uh, reproduction for this kind of a uh, uh, concept of reproductive fitness that involve this kind of uh, uh, conditions lead this animal, for example, to an enormous amount of stress. Corticosteroids that actually, well, corticosteroids, we have cortisol, uh, animal have corticosteroids, lead to certain kind of damages, and there are a huge amount of evidence, and that we'll potentially discuss later, the phenomenon of stress and, uh, and the potential uh, uh, hormone of stress. And uh, in some way, uh, uh, salmon that actually is spawning, uh, spawning uh, in, in the Atlantic Actually, they live five times longer than actually uh, they live into the Pacific salmon. Also, another very simple thing that, uh, uh, and I want to bring this, this uh, because uh, it's not only us uh, human beings that uh, are getting uh, older and uh, the mechanism of aging, but uh, doing this kind of comparative analysis, we will have even a better perspective. So, for example, Annie B. Annie B., uh, uh, they have, uh, for example, queens that actually uh, major role is basically fertilized leg, always for this kind of a uh, reproductive fitness for the best fit. Basically, they live longer, at least the five, ten years, than actually drones. They actually they have uh, really to uh, they have a completely different kind of work to do, actually to bring uh, and uh, support uh, with food uh, uh, for the survival of the species. Now, uh, we know that the mechanical damages, for example, in Annie B, is one of what uh, we can compare, for example, to traumatic injury that uh, basically lead to this kind of species to really to live longer, to live actually much shorter life. Even in worms, uh, there are studies that, that were identified, for example, that uh, a single mutation has been able really to make a diverse ramify in different kind of worms that actually can survive or eventually die. Uh, there was a, a seminal work uh, uh, where, uh, um, where actually there's been identified H1 that is basically the major kind of uh, genome susceptibility uh, in worm, and uh, uh, that is also identified even as being age one, a fundamental gene that actually make us uh, living longer. So we can we can learn from salmon. We can live. Uh, we can learn from anybody. We can learn from worm. We can actually understanding even the worm, understanding long term potentiation that is basically electrophysiological characteristics of a cognitive of our memory function. It's been actually developed from C. elegans that actually is a worm that was found in Central Park in New York. So 
all of this just to give you an idea that we are all always in the same boat. Now, why these things happen? And uh, we can talk about uh, the theories of aging, why? But uh, maybe uh, I'm sure that uh, you are going to be very curious to see how this eventually reflect into the real world and getting into the real subject of the baby boomer. But now actually baby boomer like uh, I am, the baby boomer one and baby boomer two, the people actually that I, if I remember correctly, is basically the age of... Uh, uh, from uh, I think as a 64 uh, from the 50 to this uh, to 64 and then uh, to 65 to 70 and also the most important things that actually the baby boomer now they are encountering one of the fundamental probably uh, uh, probably uh, for the first time of course uh, we go of course with different kind of uh, uh, caveats uh, different kind of aspects. But actually, these are the population that uh, are now under the financial condition, the economic condition, mm -hmm. the world of turmoil, all these different things that actually they are going to go into the process of retirement. And uh, from here, there are uh, probably, uh, despite all this kind of philosophical aspect that we discussed so far, now we are really need to move on into the real world and try to see what we learn from the past and how we can move on, not only for the baby boomer, but the millennial, the generation mm -hmm. yep, yep. S, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's, um, that's the upcoming. We have about, gosh, 12 minutes. So we got many questions. So I just want to touch on some of the highlights. And I appreciate your expertise and just a wealth and a depth of um, explanation that you provide. Um, I want to touch on brain resilience. As humans, we're constantly in pursuit of happiness and fulfillment. We try different things in order to find what works for us. Some people develop a personal mission statement. Others cultivate um, a circle of supportive friends and others get physically active. But what about the things that we don't think about? Uh, things that are automatic for us, like laughing, um, finding humor in everyday life, or things that we would rather not think about, like stress management. All of these things are important for our overall well-being, and, and they play a role in our biological aging. So um, one of the most important factors, as you mentioned, is the brain resilience. So can you elaborate brain resilience and, and how that helps with biological aging? Very good, important question. And then in these days, uh, since 20 years ago, we initiated one program about resilience and uh, in our institution now resilience is actually used for resilience on the market uh on the stock market the resilience into car and the tires all these kind of different things now the concept of resilience is basically the capacity uh and again uh inter the inter-individual kind of uh, responses uh to try to cope uh to condition that can be stressful condition and uh, um, uh, starting from, uh, in a nutshell, starting from uh, uh, experimental model, we have seen that uh, even the inbred mice that are all identical, so they are basically not necessarily a reflection of what is happening into the human. Uh, we actually, we can identify animal that can become susceptible or are actually resilient. Now, this is actually enter one of the fundamental aspects of, uh, uh, of what is maybe uh, answering in a nutshell also to your own question. Now, um, uh, there are uh, uh, um, uh, stress is basically one of the fundamental parts, mental health, uh, where we can find a, a piece of with us, uh, how we can actually promote the resilience such that our quality of life can improve. Now, there is not a magic bullet. The animal model actually suggests that, that indeed, uh, under stress, you can actually can accumulate not only just uh, stressful condition associated to the peripheral immune system, but actually lead to a, a huge amount of potential changes in the central nervous system associated to inflammatory cascades. Now, inflammation and immune inflammatory responses are actually very important to keep an under these circumstances over here. So the concept of a resilience in terms of stress is also very important. But uh, to give you a general perspective uh, of uh, 
what has been uh, uh, a kind of a um, documentation, actually, documentation, a paper, a report uh, that from the Lancet Commission that I always use uh, in uh, in uh, my uh, in my presentation. Resilience is, is uh, always to be seen as something on a graphic where basically uh, there are uh, possibilities that uh, once we became so divergent human and that uh, we are now in the process of aging, now we have, uh, we are basically, since we were born, uh, we are actually exposed to certain kind of condition that eventually will lead to successful uh, and successful aging and eventually to prevent uh, some kind of uh, Ah, uh, what I just said before, senescence, uh, they basically the disease over the organ that eventually lead to a potential increased mortality. Uh, although mortality, even in these last days, is very difficult to calculate in the last two, three hundred years because we don't have uh, the date. But actually, let's uh, try to remain to today. It's uh, very important to keep in mind that we have, uh, uh, it's become very clear, for example, that uh, 65% of uh, factors that actually we are uh, confronting in our life are basically uh, irreversible. Now, the question that the irreversible 65% is because there is some kind of genetic, uh, genetic aspect that are maybe segregated into this kind of population, in our population, and 35% uh, actually factor that can be preventable. Those uh, capacity to cope with this kind of uh, uh, re this, uh, preventable uh, uh, risk factor that can accelerate aging and then eventually accelerating aging in the sense that actually we can end up into the process of, uh, of uh, senescence are extremely very important. I just named a few. And uh, for example, and uh, this is uh, something extremely important for our own community, for the baby boomer, loneliness that uh, I, mm -hmm. I thought that was uh, uh, I thought it was an extremely kind of very interesting factors uh, is, uh, is playing an important role on, uh, on mental health and the capacity to be resilient against uh, this kind of condition. Loneliness, uh, for example, uh, even uh, in terms of prevalence uh, is basically, of course, in Japan, uh, of course, is uh, much less than the United States, just because of we are uh, we have one tenth of the population into the uh, into the in Japan versus the U.S. But the incidence that actually is the number of new cases additional added to the number of cases that uh, are already in process is basically is a basically twice as much if it's not three times that is actually a societal kind of changes uh, i just mentioned loneliness but actually one of the top priority quality of life we will not have time to really to get into the, maybe the uh, the cause of uh, the biological aging uh, biological aging but lifestyles and dietary lifestyles are in these days a fundamental part we actually see for example and uh, uh, for example in india just to have an idea the quality of lifestyles in terms of dietary lifestyles led to an endemic diabetes that eventually will have all its own consequences in terms of metabolic syndrome the actually more complex kind of disease diabetes obesity uh, overweight hypertension hyperglycemia and all these kind of different things but if this is exaggerated into the uh, into these uh, kind of a uh, demographical changes that actually are part of our uh, of our changing world uh, uh, this is something also that we need to keep in mind even in our own society uh, and uh, is uh, a society and in particular in uh, in uh, in uh, North America and Western in uh, and, and in Europe this is actually a uh, a, a continuous kind of a uh, hammering to the population that if we are not going to spend our own time uh, in uh, developing our, all our lifestyle with exercise, with a better mm -hmm. diet, with a better lifestyle, with uh, the way of uh, how we integrate with the people that actually are in need to promote, uh, uh, to avoid loneliness, uh, to prevent diabetes, 
and all these kind of different things, we are doomed to basically to get into the process of aging and not only the process of aging, but actually the process of aging that are actually characterized by senescence. I want also to tell you one thing. It might be up here, maybe it's wrong, but I think it's actually not that kind of wrong. You can be senescent at the age of 30 and you can be actually uh, successful aging at the age of 90s. And mm -hmm. it only depend based on, uh, uh, based on uh, your question. That is optional. It's depending mm -hmm. on us. It's, now, it's how much ownership you want to take and the choices that you make day to day to have healthy lifestyle, right? So when it's optional, to me, that means you, you have the empowerment to determine the direction and how you're going to age. I want to take a little pause. I want to let folks know that LinkedIn sometimes will cut us off in one hour. If that's the case, I apologize. Uh, we will continue to have this conversation past one hour. So it's just, you know, stay, stay with us. But if it disconnects, I have to apologize ahead of time. Um, so um, I wholeheartedly appreciate your, your thoughts, your, your expertise and the depth that you're explaining in this. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, whether or not the millennials and the Generation X will experience um, successful aging. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a very captivating uh, topic. Over the next few decades, the majority of us will be entering into our golden years. So well, what does that mean for those who are currently in their 20s and 30s? Will you be able to stay healthy and active? Will you be able to afford the life, you know, uh, to live comfortably as you get older? Um, this is something, you know, we ought to be talking about, or at least I'm very excited to have that uh, discussion here. In my opinion, having gone through it, I'm 55. I believe that if we take care of ourselves now, 20s, 30s, 55, we can definitely have successful aging experience. And it's going to take a lot of work, commitment, consistency, and support, right? We'll need to make sure that we stay physically active, eat healthy foods, get enough sleep, manage your stress level, challenge your mind with new activities, keep learning and growing. This conversation, in preparation for this, I had to learn a lot. I had to do a lot of research. And... Um, that drives me. And out of this conversation, I feel like I'm even going to be more empowered to make better choices um, and also connect with your spiritual side. Express yourself creatively. Take care of your financial health. That's huge because many of us, uh, many baby boomers are on a fixed income. So to have that financial preparation for long term care, for instance, is huge. So the possibilities are endless. So I guess. Um, in your opinion, successful aging, what does that look like for millennials and Generation X? There is no question about it. Uh, as uh, we move on uh, with technological advances and uh, innovation in our way uh, how to detect the disease and make prevention uh, and, uh, and, uh, and new discoveries that uh, we still don't know is a, is a fundamental part. I expect that the Generation X, uh, millennial already, uh, eventually the generation uh, generation uh, alpha uh, they will be definitely benefit on the conceptual framework that I express and I apologize that maybe I spent too much of time on that but to create a kind of framework of where we are going where we're coming from where we are going but it's a fundamental part that is a, indeed this new generation will basically capitalize on our mistake and they will understand exactly what you are saying. The fundamental part of them, we did not touch, for example, the concept of aging and successful aging in male and females. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for example, the uh, for some reason, uh, and every George Perry that actually is, uh, will concord with me, two thirds of the subject with Alzheimer's disease are actually female. There are actually very good example uh, uh, there are very good examples that uh, very good example, very uh, high science that actually is uh, is uh, is undergoing to better understand why female actually uh, why female they actually they are more kind of susceptible to this kind of condition. So, well, there is uh, definitely no question about that. Uh, the idea is that uh, 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 sex uh, sex genes that actually women carry XX genes. 
uh, and actually has been found gene of uh, susceptibility. Uh, for example, one recent gene, the KDMS6A, has been found uh, really a potential associated to the onset of Alzheimer's disease in female. NIH and National Institute of Health recognize that this kind of very important aspect, not only in the Alzheimer's disease, but is actually our own, uh, I think it's our, our own uh, uh, as, uh, as a scientist and as a citizen, and uh, uh, we need to outreach and doing much more kind of research in uh, in women, uh, women uh, not only just for the sex point of view. Sex is actually always related to the sex reproduction, but also to understand the potential mechanism of a, a woman as a gender. They actually participate into the different kind of environmental factors. Uh, now it's also very true that there are a certain kind of gene susceptibility. A polypoprotein E4 is actually very important uh, for a potential prevention and understanding why the potential role of these uh, two thirds of the population of the female into this kind of uh, disease. So uh, many kind of uh, ethnicity aspect is very important. And again, as you said, as we move on into the population that eventually uh, will sooner or later get in uh, retire, that they're gonna break, actually there will be a bankruptcy of Medicare. We have to start thinking about that this ecological kind of a, a baby boomer kind of a approach for technological advances need to take care of themselves to try to identify communities, avoid the uh, assisted senior living and maybe enter into the major community. And this also is very important because in this kind of community, uh, even with uh, even if in 2030, probably that there will be no money for uh, the uh, uh, to pay Medicare. Mm -hmm. The idea is basically exercise, sleep, uh, maintain active brain, uh, and then uh, and then uh, to keep track into the preventative initiative that uh, uh, that may be based on our own past life. And now I want also to tell you, and a very important kind of factor that may open even another kind of very important kind of a new avenue of investigation is that the Lancet Commission just came out in addition to this loneliness, stress, uh, juvenile diabetes that actually can promote eventually cognitive deterioration later in aging through mechanism associated to epigenetics actually included environmental uh, pollution. Is a, uh, environmental pollution is Alzheimer's disease is one of the top highest kind of uh, potential uh, impacts. I know George Perry, uh, the editor-in-chief in, in uh, JAD, it will have a special edition, uh, uh, one of a uh, end book on Alzheimer's disease that will be uh, fundamental uh, uh, for the people to read in the, it will be presented next year. And it will open a new kind of environment, a kind of new avenues of uh, research because uh, together with whatever it is that the our intrinsic mechanism to get old and how the brain resilient in some way as I said before, resilient the actually versus the susceptible is the way how inflammatory mechanism in the brain are able to counteract some of this kind of a condition that can prevent, for example, opening of the blood brain barrier, uh, preventing immune inflammatory responses in the brain. All these kind of different things are actually are very important. And if we understand, and indeed that this is the evidence, that the environmental toxicant that are uh, capable to promote uh, uh, cascades of events that in some way are unprecedented in cert a certain extent. Uh, environmental disaster is actually a completely different story, but nevertheless, into the modern society, we need to think about that. Uh, that will be also how the brain can become resilient. How is going to become resilient? Well, I mean, the bottom line is always uh, through exercise, dietary lifestyles, engage in uh, as much as possible in societal and uh, discussion, even with your neighbor, knowing that your neighbor is actually uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, is uh, uh, experienced loneliness, uh, try to help. It's actually very good to you as well as uh, to the other one. 
a very important other factors uh, that, that we need to consider that in general, uh, females uh, that actually uh, have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease also have uh, probably higher, and it's not very clear, higher incidence of mortality. Who are going to take care of us in the next 20, 30 years if we don't have a caregivers? Studies mm -hmm. that Dr. Daman Sinai suggested, that, for example, that caregivers are at are, a are very high much risk for developing dementia compared, for example, to uh, uh, compared to subject with dementia itself. It might appear strange to you, maybe anecdotal, but uh, if we keep going on in this way, I can tell you that basically, uh, the best caregiver, uh, probably the best caregiver for uh, people uh, of our age, baby boomer, that eventually will develop Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. are going to be our parents. And that basically they were the survival of the best fit into the evolutionary process that actually we discussed from the beginning. Because uh, this is, uh, appears strange and maybe ridiculous, but that is exactly what we are facing into the uh, next 20 years, and hopefully in 2023, we will have uh, the opportunity to support Medicare because uh, we are talking about people that uh, 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 will not be able really to support uh, extra 2,000, 3,000 uh, cost of, uh, of, uh, of uh, medication and, uh, uh, and support. Uh, as we move on uh, 2023. And after 2023, probably there will be not even that kind of money to really support. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Boy, this conversation can be a whole college course, you know? And yeah, actually, I, I thank uh, you. <laughs> actually, I, and when you, uh, when, uh, I have to be honest, uh, when uh, when we, you said uh, send me four, uh, you sent me for a bullet point form. You will send me a kind of, uh, actually, this could be the synopsis of, uh, maybe uh, sometimes I teach a, uh, I teach a seminar course. This will be actually the beginning. And maybe I'm going to invite you to give me a talk and actually present something. It's been a really phenomenal kind of a way of how to really to discuss. And I, I'm sure that there are a lot of the audience over here that they will say, well, Dr. Cassetti has been superficial in some way or the other. It didn't give the exact idea. Uh, it was not maybe distorted a little bit. Uh, please forgive me. I tried to do uh, what I think was the best for the general audience and for the people that need to understand the fundamental role, where we are coming from and where we end up to be. If we don't understand where we are coming from, we will never really understand where we are going to be because uh, nature is still under uh, putting pressure on us to become uh, more diverse, be reproductive, uh, uh, more as much reproductive uh, to the promotion of this species, and possibly, maybe, with this kind of technological advances and a better understanding of the biology of aging, and most important thing the concept of senescence, we will be able to live, uh, uh, will to live uh, maybe uh, as much as actually we want. Uh, last one thing that I want just to tell you, uh, there is something, if we actually looking at the mortality rate, the best uh, age to live is basically at the age of puberty. Basically 0.5%, 0 uh, 0 0 0.5% is basically the mortality rate at the age of, uh, in the, uh, during puberty. So basically one over 2000 subject eventually die. If we actually move on to, uh, if we move on, uh, if uh, we move on to the age of 90, and then uh, uh, we, uh, well, we know that actually the incidence uh, is basically uh, at, at the age of 90, now is basically 50%. But for a moment, in an ideal world, if we continue to experience uh, the mortality rate uh, at the puberty, and then uh, we are, uh, extrapolate this one, considering even a triction rate of actually the evolution, actually, of the age that actually we move forward, we basically, with a kind of rate of mortality, we will be able to live at the age of 1,200. I don't mm -hmm. know if this is exactly what we want to do. So there is always something in between. 
I think, as I understand this in essence, understanding the difference between successful aging and the pathological aging that is basically senescence or uh, the lack of a capacity of our organ to become resilient and how the brain eventually will be able to have psychological mechanism and then communicate with the immune system. The idea that the guts, for example, communicate with the immune system and the brain opening all this kind of new area of the gut microbiome that is still a very, uh, very early kind of, a, I would say, modern and uh, mo it's not modern, actually has been known for a long time, but actually is a is it's too early to really to make and uh, anticipate that we will have a beneficial effect from uh, microbiome, although there are very good evidence, even if, for example, yeah, under certain circumstances, mental health and microbiome that can influence beneficial effect of the immune system in the periphery. And remember, 70% of our immune system actually uh, is, is in the gut. And then if we, through the gut, and then uh, always going back to the modifiable style factor, exercise, diet that can promote the microbiome, and basically having the guts that actually can promote a better immunological response that can eventually prevent even some kind of a, those uh, uh, stressful condition that may be uh, lead to some kind of uh, uh, changes in the brain, open the blood brain barrier, uh, possibilities of penetration in perivascular region of the of the brain of inflammatory degeneratory cells. Um, well, uh, I think this is actually as a part of the brain is actually what we consider resilience. How many resilient brain we have? Well, I mean, actually, I think is uh, is much easier than anything. I can tell you, if you're gonna go and do exercise, you change the diet. And then you are gonna uh, you adapt a kind of a uh, adapt a kind of a quality of life where you are not gonna think only just for yourself, but actually you're gonna help for your own neighbor. Uh, the understanding that uh, the loneliness, actually, as I said before, are need in need support to the caregiver. They are basically, mm -hmm. as I said before, even a higher risk for dementia. I think this is actually the message for resilience as uh, we become resilient only not only the brain. The brain is basically just a way how to tell us how to refine our own behavior. Now moving on, including myself, into one very difficult phase, difficult, but a new journey of our life. Uh, actually, I was thinking about that uh, once I'm going to maybe, uh, I will continue to be a scientist until I am 120. But actually, <laughs> my passion is to become an airlines pilot. And then maybe oh. 120, if, uh, uh, if 120, uh, some company are going to hire me, uh, maybe, and uh, we are going to have another one when I'm going to be 120. But you are going to steal a little girl, uh, nevertheless. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for your passion and your dedication and your service to, to you know, students and staff and for people like myself, because we all want to live as long as possible with the most quality of life. And, you know, aging is something that we all have to go through and there's no need for it to be as difficult as it often is. And as you mentioned, Scientists are always learning more about biology of aging, and we're learning more and more every day how we can influence our own aging process. As you mentioned, the brain is a huge part of this process. And, yes. and as you mentioned again, the brain may be the single most important factor in determining how quickly we age biologically. But this doesn't mean that aging is inevitable. It means that we have a lot of power to control how we Correct. age simply by making healthy choices in our lives. So this is good news for the baby boomers who are Absolutely. increasingly... And also for the millennial Generation X and Generation mm -hmm. S. Absolutely. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, baby boomers are doing everything they can to stay healthy and active as they age. And it's good, just like you said, millennials, Generation X, they're going to continue to enjoy successful aging as well into their golden years. So what does that mean for us? Well... It means that we can take charge of our health and our futures, and that is something worth celebrating. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your passion, and uh, until next time.
Take care. And thank you for having me. Absolutely.